I'm joined by two guests today. Dr. Ray Zimmerman is a research professor and professor emerita of planning and public administration at NYU's Robert F. Wagner School of Public Service. She spent many years there as a full-time professor and is a director of the school's Institute for Civil Infrastructure Systems, initially funded by the National Science Foundation. Dr. Kwon Yun Zhu is an associate professor at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at NYU after spending some time at Princeton. He's also affiliated faculty member of the Center of, for Urban Science and Progress, or CUSP, at NYU. Today's topic is developing resilient mechanisms to cybersecurity threats in connected and autonomous vehicles from anomaly detection to multimodal planning. Please feel free to type your questions in the presentation um, all throughout using the chat box below. We'll have some time at the end during which I'll read your questions out loud to the presenters. Dr. Zimmerman, please take it away. Yeah. Hello, everyone. So glad you could join us here. Uh, as you can see from the screen, we have, this is one of uh, a number of projects that the C2 Smart Center has, uh, has funded. Very uh, glad that they uh, have been able to contribute. Uh, I can go through the uh, outline right now. Okay. Uh, basically, uh, there's a problem here. There's a vehicular ad hoc network, VNet, which provides actually communication among vehicles and it allows a connected and a, an autonomous transportation system uh, to exist. However, uh, cyber attacks can compromise um, the security of those systems. So our objective has been to promote security from cyber intrusions in connected autonomous vehicles. And the approach uh, is twofold. First of all, uh, there are computational and analytical frameworks that have been developed uh, to, first of all, assess the cyber risks of those vehicles, CAVs for short, and develop detection techniques based on learning algorithms uh, and then finally, we look to approaches and solutions, not to be too negative. Uh, there are proposed multimodal strategies uh, to support resilience CAV deployment, which takes into account how people travel, why they travel, the trip purposes, and uh, what modes they take, and human behavior towards uh, calves as well, and those are combined basically into a uh, into a solution strategy. And right now, Kuan Yan, Professor Kuan Yan Zhu, will take over uh, talking about uh, some of the issues and the algorithms. Well, I'm happy to join um, this webinar. So um, let me start with talking about um, some generic settings of the work that we are doing here. So we start with the, uh, um, this modern road network. Here you can see this is just illustration of a uh, VA net where you see um, there's a vehicle to vehicle communication um, on the road and there is a vehicle to uh, infrastructure communication and infrastructure to infrastructure communication. The, uh, the communication enables the uh, um, lot of uh, uh, important features uh, of transportation systems. One of them is the control system. And it also facilitates the business operations and the other interfaces, as well as I think one of the modern day applications is um, how can we leverage this communication to uh, increase the safety and also enable the driverless uh, autonomous vehicles. So um, when it comes to cyber security and, this, and of autonomous vehicles, um, there are so many levels of issues. One of the issue is coming from the um, different components that a, uh, a vehicle is consisting of. And uh, you can see in this picture, you know, um, if you are buying a vehicle or manufacturing a vehicle, there are many different components here, including the uh, um, uh, communication component, auto, uh, automation component, battery, and uh, navigation and mapping, and a sensor and hardware. So a lot, of these, a lot of these components are put together into the manufacturing of a autonomous vehicle. And it's, it's hard to um, guarantee that there is no um, vulnerabilities in all these components put together. 
So it's natural that uh, um, it creates a lot of, uh, open, uh, opens a lot of uh, uh, doors for intrusion, um, as well as uh, creates a lot of risk for us to uh, understand in this uh, new paradigm of uh, um, autonomous vehicles. So on top of that, you know, um, the, uh, the issue is also related to uh, the traffic management and the congestion control. Suppose that there is a uh, compromise of a vehicle. Well, now we have to ask ourselves, how can we do the traffic management and the congestion control when uh, certain vehicles are being compromised? Or even um, could be the case where the traffic lights are being compromised. So, and then you have issues that are associated with the socioeconomic impact of uh, connected vehicles when there are collision of the two autonomous vehicles or a collision between autonomous vehicles and a, a, a pedestrian. So what would be um, the uh, uh, consequences and how the traffic can reconfigure in that context? So what we're gonna focus on here is a, uh, is a simple, simpler story uh, instead of taking a multi-layer one. So what we're gonna focus on is a vehicle level, looking at a communication between vehicles and I'm trying to understand the uh, assessment of the risks and the, uh, how you actually trust the messages that are, that are coming from other vehicles when they are communicating with each other. So what we try to do here is, um, is, uh, is leveraging um, the, uh, the computational uh, intrusion detection uh, mechanisms that we have developed in a distributed machine learning context and apply it to um, the VA nets. So here is a general architecture. So what we do is, so there is a module here that supports the communication um, between the uh, neighboring, uh, neighboring um, vehicles. And then we are going to, uh, each vehicle is going to monitor the communication and try to detect whether there is anything on the uh, communication channel, the data that you receive that has something suspicious anomaly. And then uh, at the same time, we also want this detection to have the property of a privacy preserving in a, in a sense that we don't want to leak out information or uh, making sure that the information that you give to other people um, is not going to be very sensitive. So, and, um, and obviously there are many things can go wrong, not just uh, the communications between vehicles, um, but it can be a, a, a control logic, could be wireless connections, and it could be even a scheduler of the, of the transportation. The many things in the system actually can go wrong. So um, one thing that can go wrong because of the uh, 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 because of the intrusion is, I mean, this is just a something uh, that happens at the uh, uh, infrastructure and the vehicle communication level. So uh, traffic lights um, can uh, go off and or or being attacked. And then you can see that there is a uh, uh, chaotic behaviors that is in the transportation. And you can see there is a, um, in this case, there's a random routes and normal traffic lights for this particular edge that we try to simulate. Um, you can see that in the, in the figure, you can see that suddenly there's a travel time um, um, becomes, um, you know, the, 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 when you have the, the, the X axis is travel time, uh, y axis is the uh, the mean speed, and um, and the, the the second figure is to try to show the travel time and the uh, density of the the, uh, the the vehicles on the traffic. So when there is a uh, something, there's a disruption while the, some of the link is going down, and uh, and you can see that there is a sudden drop in terms of the speed, and there is a congestion coming up. So. So in other words, the, the security issue is not just a sting at the vehicle level, but it can propagate um, to a uh, transportation and a macroscopic level if not being detected very quickly. So what we're gonna do is at the, uh, uh, not at the, uh, uh, the first issue what I'm gonna do here is looking at the communication level issues and how you do detection. So as I have said, so the one technique that we're using here is what we call distributed uh, machine learning. So in other words, every node, think about here, each node is a vehicle and uh, each of the vehicles is going to do some classification of anomaly. So thinking about there are some data point that's been collected and, um, and each, each player, each node here is going to classify, uh, make a decision on whether certain data um, that you receive is anomaly or not or some behavior that you observe is anomaly or not. So then nodes and nodes, they can actually communicate with their classifiers instead of, instead of uh, communicating their data 
um, they actually can um, improve um, together collaboratively um, in terms of their classification result. So in other words, if your each node may only have a very small amount of a training data, but the when the each node, node and node communicate together and to put all the data together uh, without directly communicating the data, you actually can improve the, um, the, the, uh, the classification result. So, and, um, and, and this is a, a simple algorithm, so I'm not going to elaborate too much of, uh, on it. Uh, so if you, for people who are interested, you know, they can read the paper here. But what we're gonna do, so at each starting point, each node is going to compute some parameters, and then after they um, uh, compute their parameters, then each node is gonna broadcast their uh, classification um, decision to all the neighbors they meet. And thinking about in a transportation system, this these topology could be changed over time, but as long as you meet somebody and you can exchange that uh, piece of information with your neighbor. And then based on this neighbor, uh, neighbor information that you receive, and then you are able to update um, your classifier. And this way, you actually can gradually learn how to detect uh, anomaly in a better way. So uh, what is the, the important feature of this distributed algorithm? The first one is because of the distributed nature, so um, there is a sort of robustness to the poisoning attacks in the system. So in other words, even though you're, um, you know, there's a poisoning of one data point um, that in your, uh, in your node or in your vehicle, but hopefully the other vehicles are not poisoned um, and so that you actually can be able to recover because of other data that you receive. Second is that it is all, there is also privacy preserving mechanisms sitting down here. So we are not going into the details of the privacy preserving for interested uh, uh, audience, they can read the, the paper here that I just outlined. So you can also care about, so what if the other um, guy, the other nodes that, that receiving your classifier can actually uh, learn some information about your data set. So in other words, when you would try to communicate information between vehicles, you also have to be care, taking, uh, taking into account the privacy issues. The, second, the third point here about the feature of this distributed algorithm is that this actually creates a lot of incentives for data and information sharing. So instead of sharing the data directly, what you do here is sharing the results, right? So that actually creates a lot of uh, new incentives for sharing data because sharing data could be very cumbersome because of a lot of unwillingness in terms of uh, a data, especially the data is sensitive. And, and now here, we are not sharing data directly, um, but instead we are sharing the results. So you're helping other people to prove, improve uh, the classifier without sharing data directly, but sharing the results of the data. The fourth feature of this um, distributor algorithm is that actually enables econo economics, new economics of information security. So in a sense that when you have sharing of the data, then the question would be, do we have people have a platform to have incentive to contribute um, to the data platform? So there's a lot of interesting questions. We are not going to the details, but for interesting audience, they can um, go to the papers down here. So um, as I said, so when it comes to uh, intrusion detection systems, um, so we, the goal is we want, to, we want to prevent things from happening. We want to detect something at have time before things start to happen. But obviously when it comes to a communication and a link to link communication and a data transmission, there's always um, some cases where we're not able to um, make sure that we can cap, uh, capture or catch the, uh, the incidents in time. So that might it would lead to certain failures. But, and also that these failures, as I said earlier, um, could lead to a loss of a node, or sometimes it could be a loss of a link or in terms of the congestion. And then what could be the other consequences is that these losses of links and nodes and actually could lead to a, a, a further impacts on other systems, could be on other infrastructure systems, or it could be propagate to other uh, components in the entire transportation network. So that's why we're also thinking about what should we do just in case that the intrusion detection system fails. So, well, I mean, we need, instead of, instead of just understanding the, the, the vehicle level issues, we have to expand our scope and understand are there other ways um, to understand the third order effect and the fourth order effect. So, and one approach here is to understand it from a multi-model uh, transportation viewpoint. 
So because the CAV integration um, is, in, is, is integrated um, into um, the, uh, the existing transportation system, then you have a coexistence of a different modes of transportation. Now the question is, how can we leverage different modes of transportation and connectivities to um, make the system more resilient when there is a um, failure in the system due to a cyber attacks. So I will leave that to what uh, Ray to discuss. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Does the uh, hmm. Okay. Uh, as uh, Kuan Yang pointed out, there is an extremely complex multimodal transportation system. And frankly, it is different uh, in every, within different parts of a city, uh, from city to city, state to state, country to country. And uh, the question is where to fit in the autonomous car sharing uh, vehicles and what are the uh, ways of thinking to do that. So in order to begin that process, uh, what we did was, uh, you know, the, so the basic question is how can the CAV and multimodal con connections increase in what existing transportation networks, how can they increase the resilience when cyber attacks uh, and other hazards occur. So one simple way to begin all of that, the first step is to say, well, how do people travel? Uh, what are the purposes? Uh, define where people travel. And we're very fortunate uh, to have a very big database at multiple geographic scales uh, from the US DOT Federal Highway Administration uh, that does track travel trends by purpose. And I've given you just a few of these uh, statistics nationwide, but can, it can be drilled down to urban areas. So in 2017, the uh, uh, people uh, the, the basically the uh, amount of travel uh, was highest uh, for social and recreational purposes. That's possibly why it is, uh, you know, difficult to deal with uh, uh, social distancing. And uh, so uh, over a quarter of the people traveling traveled for social recreational. And then there was roughly a tie uh, between travel for other family and personal errands and shopping, uh, and then a little less so for to and from work. You would think that the to and from work would be very, very high, but the fact is um, it's, it's exceeded by these other personal modes of travel. And then we look back at the 2009 data uh, and you see that it's roughly, um, there's roughly the same uh, proportion uh, and with social and recreational exceeding other forms of travel. And actually journeys to and from work were a little bit, had a li little bit less of a share in 2009 uh, than in 2000, um, 2017. And this data, is from the National Household Travel Survey um, that's done, uh, oh, uh, you know, every few years. Uh, secondly, the second step then is now to integrate mode, uh, to combine mode with trip type uh, in order to see how we could uh, actually integrate and incorporate uh, tabs. So what you see here uh, is again at the 2017, um, the obvious thing that you see here is the tremendous dominance of the private vehicle regardless of what the trip purpose is. 
and uh, you you see much more uh, dominance of uh, of private vehicles uh, for the to and from work trip and shopping and errands. Those tend to be a little bit longer. And then the second is a sort of all purposes, and the th that's a summary really. But uh, and then you have uh, work related business, which is different from to and from work and fewer, relatively fewer, but still very high percentages uh, do, uh, uh, the private vehicle does account for, again, school and church trips, social recreational and other trips. Public transit, and again, these are nationwide figures, they vary for different urban areas. Public transit, highest for to and from work, and really below 5% for all of the other trip purposes. Walking, interestingly, is becoming, uh, is ex it exceeds public transit in many different ways. Um, it's about 18%, uh, you know, almost a fifth of social recreational trips. They tend to be perhaps more local, shorter distance trips. Uh, and then you have about 10% uh, 12 percent for other trips and uh, uh, school and and church and then less for for other other kinds of travel and then they do have a catch-all other modes of travel i i never like to see large numbers in the other category and i'm not sure how that disaggregates but 16 percent for school and um, and church and the reason for setting uh this up this way is to say, well, okay, uh, if we wanted to introduce uh, connected autonomous vehicles, what would be the most fruitful way to do this? And what would be acceptable to people? So arbitrarily, I just increased from the previous 80%, 70%, um, uh, Wait, for shopping and errands, 88% uh, and social recreational was 77%. Um, uh, and I increased those uh, arbitrarily to 95 and 90% shares and the others go down proportionally. And this would be if we decided that cab travel for uh, shopping and social trips was more acceptable to people. And it's important to introduce here human behavior. What is public acceptability? What are people's perceptions about calves? Their misgivings, their, their uh, uh, enthusiasm and so forth so that you could actually increase those uh, two components. And uh, Basically, there are uh, both technological and human behavioral components relevant to cab integration into urban transportation multimodal connectivity. Um, first of all, these cabs need places to park and refuel. And, you know, again, these are the technological factors. Then they have to be near, if we're going to talk about integration to other modes, the calves have to be um, near the other modes and the other modes have to be available to them. And there are third, there has to be the technology for and flexibility to connect with non-cav modes such as ride sharing, for hire services and the like. You know, this is a big leap. And then fourth, communication capability to identify the connections. Fifth, um, uh, out of uh, uh, the National Academy's uh, study uh, on shared mobility, uh, there is um, you have to have compet you have to understand competition versus compatibility. Uh, between calves and other modes, including relative congestion, travel time, cost, complexity in assigning riders to vehicles. Um, and then sixth, there are overall supply logistics and strategies, especially for emergencies 
and Oskaven uh, multimodal logic architecture uh, in 2015 uh, identified this as well as Holgen Veris's work uh, back in 2007. And finally, uh, which I'll go into now a little bit more, is the attractiveness of the calves to passengers. What will make them use the calves? And essentially, just to make this really very, um, uh, very succinct, uh, we, we've um, our, our uh, final report on the C2 Smart project goes into these factors a little bit more. But we have to overcome the safety and perceived uh, fear issue, as well as the security issues from cyber attacks, which will also uh, create a link to safety factors. Uh, I was actually uh, in Tempe the day that the autonomous vehicle uh, crashed and killed a woman standing um, uh, with her bicycle uh, on the roadway. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, this, this one accident like that will actually have a big effect. I was actually on the same roadway she was on, but I wasn't there at the same time. Um, secondly, uh, is it available to people? How convenient uh, is it? Uh, is it accessible? It can be available, but people have to get to these vehicles. And then finally, uh, the costs as well. And I do give a number of uh, citations that go into this, um, to this factor. So it's a big leap from something like calves to the way, from, from the way people drive, the modes they take, uh, to actually uh, introducing these and getting the safety benefits uh, that allegedly are offered by, uh, offered by calves. It is true, NHTSA has been showing uh, maybe about 3% declines in traffic fatalities, but the fact is they're still very big. And the idea is that uh, if you have a, uh, uh, you know, an autonomous vehicle, uh, you eliminate the human error from the accidents. Um, and here is a schematic. It appears as figure eight in our report, section four, but basically look at the core, uh, the boxes indicate all of the different trip purposes that I went into uh, before, even a few more, getting food, shopping, uh, and the like. And on the left, um, just to the left of the boxes, is how people tend to travel for these different uh, trip purposes. And uh, it's based on a lot of literature. The thickness of the lines is how uh, it's, uh, people are more likely to travel, like individual auto, the work, for shopping um, and for food, the thickest. And um, you could, what you could do here is introduce calves indirectly via the other modes. So the calves wouldn't be passenger uh, oriented, but the calves would support, for example, the dotted uh, line here on the left, rail, short distance rail. Um, and uh, there'd be no people involved, people wouldn't get afraid, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's a potential. On the extreme right, however, is introducing calves directly linked to a trip purpose. Uh, emergency purposes are now being viewed uh, as the way to introduce connected autonomous vehicles the urban search and rescue where people, you don't want to endanger the emergency workers, so you send these cars in. Robots are, are also uh, taking up this responsibility, but sometimes you need cars as well. Uh, and again, uh, other potential modes being shopping and recreation. Now shopping would be if the people aren't in the car, but they're asking the autonomous vehicle to pick up their packages from a store, or the store is using a cab uh, to deliver the packages in. And similarly, uh, recreational is a little bit, a uh, little bit more difficult. So, uh, in summary and conclusion, um, the cyber risks are at, occur at different layers of connected autonomous vehicles. 
uh, we, uh, Professor Zhu has uh, used learning, developed learning algorithms to detect uh, anomalies in calves and multimodal planning is used to improve the resiliency of connected and autonomous transportation uh, systems. Now, trip purpose and, and mode uh, usage by trip are very important inputs to know how to integrate calves. And the trips are flexible with respect to time uh, that are more accepting like social recreational trips um, and very short trips regardless of trip purpose are dominated by non-motorized transit or EV transit. And um, the really what is fundamental here to the acceptability of CAV use is public knowledge, perception, uh, and behavior. And we want to acknowledge C2 SMART's uh, funding through uh, the US Department of Transportation uh, for this work. And of course, as a disclaimer, we are the only ones to blame here. Okay. I think we're open to questions now. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zimmerman and Dr. Zhu. As Dr. Zimmerman said, we are open to questions, so please feel free to type them into the chat box below. I will read them out loud to our presenters today. Uh, I'll start the Q&A with just uh, a couple of high-level questions. This is, uh, how safe and how secure do you think CO CAVs um, will need to be before they're on the road in large numbers? So this is talked about constantly, but I wanted to hear your perspectives in particular. Like, is, is the constraint a public per perception issue? Is it a political issue? Um, is it these safety issues that uh, Dr. Zhu was talking about earlier? What's the constraint? Well, How soon are we overcoming it? Well, one thing, uh, the how long is that the federal government uh, through a number of its orders has been very strongly behind the introduction of autonomous uh, vehicles, as you know, but uh, there's a lot of connectivity here. There's a lot of putting the pieces together. Uh, Kuan Yang, you may have a better handle on some of the technology, but it, uh, it's gonna take a long time uh, to put it together. And uh, also uh, the density of urban areas uh, can be a very major obstacle to introducing these. I have a question from the audience here. Uh, okay, so um, okay. Can some of these issues be worked out with simply increased connected vehicle testing and deployment before going to full autonomy? Well, a lot of that is going on right now, and uh, I don't think a lot of it, and uh, from what I've seen, but uh, uh, it could if, as long as the testing results came out fairly positive. <laughs> yeah. Sure, um, but so like, what if we put an emphasis on the connected vehicle aspects instead of the autonomous vehicle aspects? If that would be, you know, maybe that's a lower hur hurdle to to jump over. Would that accelerate CAVs um, presence on the road at all? Yeah, Kuan Yan, you may want to respond to that. So, so the um, so uh, I'm, I'm uh, going back to your earlier question um, about testing. Well, I think the texting is hard, uh, especially what to test. And uh, um, let's say you test A, B, C, D, um, but there is always uh, um, some X, Y, Z that hard to capture. And these can be uh, surprises and a uh, black swan events, as we call them. Um, the question is how you actually develop a, a te good testing scheme, especially when these components all together is, uh, is interconnected. And uh, as I said uh, in, in the previous picture, there is a, a component, the camera coming from somewhere else, there's a software coming from somewhere else, and there is a hardware coming from somewhere else, and there is a uh, maybe learning object coming from somewhere else. So putting them together and to test all of them, I think it's a, a tremendous amount of work. And, um, and because of there's a lot, there could be some unknown um, unknowns um, and, and it could be make this testing a tremendously hard. And um, 
uh, I mean, just take, take an example for a piece of software. I mean, just if you just want to test in the software, I think it's still a, a, a research topic um, that is being under an investigation and not, a let, not a, a let alone to say um, that we have uh, so many software and hardware put together um, into uh, um, integrated a piece. So I think testing is hard. Um, but, but if we want to say, okay, um, uh, before, um, if we just rely on testing, I, I think the hurdle um, uh, is hard to uh, cross. I think the, 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 the question is, um, is that how, how to uh, make the system more reliable and, um, and not just reliable from a technological viewpoint, but also reliability from a human perception viewpoint. So, I mean, uh, thinking about it, how long it has taken people to understand, um, actually it's, very, it's safer to, uh, to take, take an airplane uh, compared with uh, take, uh, driving, right? A lot of people would say, oh, driving um, probably is safer, but that, on the contrary, it's not true. Um, so, um, so I think that's the, um, um, the hurdles that we have. And uh, maybe you can remind me what's the second question, John? Yeah, so uh, I was gonna, so in terms of connected and autonomous vehicles, um, you know, if we maybe figured out some of these issues with the connected vehicle part, um, can, right. can maybe work out before, before the autonomous vehicle part, like before we go full autonomous, maybe we could have some sort of hybrid setup where we have just connected vehicles on the street first and that gradually gets people comfortable with the idea of full CAVs. That's a very good point. See, see, why don't we talk about CAV, right? There are two words here. Yes, one is connected, it is one autonomous. Well, well, the question is, that do we have to have them appearing at the same time or we just make them connected first and then make autonomous, right? So mm -hmm. I, I think definitely, I think uh, communication, uh, making them connected is definitely a, a key step to uh, make the transportation uh, smarter. And, um, and I think we are, I think there's a lot of researchers, including ourselves, are looking at how to leverage the connectivity, right? Obviously, connectivity, one way to leverage connectivity is to help you to uh, make it the system more autonomous. It may not be completely autonomous, but more autonomous than usual in terms of the intelligence, um, in terms of the uh, automation, and in terms of maybe um, the things that we never thought you know, a vehicle could do. Um, so, so I think the connectivity uh, definitely is, is gonna play an important role. So I cannot imagine of being autonomous without being connected. Um, and I think autonom auto automation um, has to rely on um, the connectivity first. But well, the question would be, um, how much connected? Um, is it like, um, you know, a very well connected or a sufficiently amount of connection will be enough? Well, that's maybe something that we can um, design and uh, when, uh, you know, and to think about. Uh, but definitely connectivity should have come um, before uh, being autonomous. Now, so um, now the question is what level of auto uh, 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 being autonomous um, is sufficient? Well, this is also a, a design criteria. So maybe in the urban context, um, people you know, want to be, uh, you know, be less autonomous, but when it comes to trucks, um, I think being uh, fully autonomous uh, would be more desirable. I think there will be a lot of uh, design issues uh, for different types of uh, vehicles. Yeah, I think that's something that I personally forget when thinking about these topics. It's, you know, it's, there's, in the imagination, it's easiest to think that you go from nothing to everything all at once. You know, today we have nothing, and then next, next year we have full CAVs on the road everywhere, when in reality, they, there will be a gradual introduction in, in different modes and in, in different geographies based on safety perception, based on politics, or what have you. So your point about airplane safety, I thought was interesting because you have cars, which are like automobiles are not the safest way to travel. People use them, people buy them uh, all the time. So do you think like perceptions of safety have changed over time such that uh, CAVs have to be fully safe, you know, before, before people get on, get, get on board? Um, like in reality, they might be safer right away than the current state of automobiles, but like has perception of safety and the need for a certain level of safety changed over time so that we have to have like totally flawless CAVs before they're on the road? So, well, so my, my yeah. point is this, right? So I think safety, um, the need for safety is, uh, is a part of human nature. So um, it's just like a baby uh, needs being safe, right? Um, looking for being, I mean, um, you know, 
feeling safe, you know, at home. Um, so I think that part is a human nature. It's hard to, it's, it's, it's a, uh, um, it's not, it's, it's not a something that, that um, could be rationalized um, uh, in, in a way, but it could be, could be educated and so that we can be rationalized. Um, so, so I think, I think that safety definitely is a need. So I, I think there's a lot of engineering designs in the past we have seen um, that trades off between safety and efficiency because we want probably pay, pay more, I mean, uh, uh, lay more emphasis on, on safety um, if, if we can compromise a little bit efficiency when it comes to safety. Um, and um, and I, I would say one of the reasons I think safety is important is also maybe because of the society that we live in. And uh, um, we always ask ourselves, um, what is the accountability when something goes wrong? Like say, uh, for example, like say, I think the Arizona case, um, I think Ray was pointed it out, uh, when the lady was, uh, was uh, sort of hit by the autonomous vehicle, um, who is going to be the, the who is going to be uh, uh, responsible for it? Is it the software designer or is the integration or it is the, uh, the supply chain manager, um, the designer? Um, who, is the, who is the person? Um, I think it's, it's becomes a debatable. I think, I think Ray probably has more input on it. Uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, people really, you know, what, what's going to increase uh, acceptance uh, may be uh, buried in the needs people see for such autonomous vehicles. They would have to uh, feel that uh, it makes the, if they're in the car, uh, that there are a lot of controls in there. There are ways uh, to have uh, someone be in control of the vehicle, uh, even though it's autonomous, and people may feel much more comfortable with that if they are in the car. However, if cabs are being used primarily to uh, deliver goods or uh, without people in them, that may be highly acceptable. Sure. So it's also interesting. I think people forget also about, or at least I forget, the, uh, the constraints that the legal system or the way the legal system will shape the introduction of CAVs in different, in different places. Um, I think unless I have additional questions from the audience, I have one last very high level, very non-technical question for both of you, which is uh, maybe Kwan Yan, you can start. So uh, when I hear about, you know, the, these anomaly detection uh, algorithms that you're working on. It just, you know, like any other sort of area of cybersecurity, it just, you can imagine this endless process of iteration, this like back and forth between um, malicious actors and the cybersecurity folks who are working on the other end to make CAB safe. Um, very, very abstractly ballpark, what level of safety or what do we have to get right, do you think, before CAVs? Um, can can get on the road for recreational use or for like day to day use. Oh, I think I think that's a a very big question. <laughs> um, I, think, I, think there, I think I think there are so many uh, things. Um, um, you know, um, first I would say technologically. Technologically, I think the is issue is probably easier uh, because I think there's a lot of smart people uh, working uh, towards the technological issues, so that making the system more sa secure and safer and also testing and assurance of autonomy. Um, there's a lot of work has been on these areas and also including a detection. Um, the, um, and and on, on besides that, I would say, um, it's, I think, I mean, from a social viewpoint, I, I would say besides safety, I think it's also the cost, right? So um, how, how expensive is the autonomous vehicle is gonna charge you? Um, it's, I, I, you know, um, this is, this is a one, another important factor. And I just want to also add to the point that Ray has mentioned about the social dimension. Um, so I think in a lot of things, I mean, I, this, is a, this is unique probably to the United States. I think people in the United States like to have idea or like to, to have the, the, uh, the, 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 I want to emphasize the concept of freedom, right? So when you can drive your own car, um, there is a sense of freedom. Um, and you want to own your car, um, because you have a sense of freedom because you make you feel that you can go anywhere you like and can do whatever you like and that sense of freedom oftentimes is very important when it comes to uh, people and um, And when you have autonomous vehicles, do we still have that sense of freedom or people that the reluctance 
is uh, just because of the just because people feel that they're deprived of the freedom because maybe you don't need a car um, and um, but but still you still like to own a car because of the you have a, a sense of belonging you feel that you can go anywhere in this world um, so I would say um, so technological issues I think there are um, I think there are a lot of people working on and uh, and uh, there are also economic issues as well as a, a social perception issues to to obstacles to uh, um, to cross but as I as I like to be very hopeful um, I've seen so many um, examples in the past um, you know uh, if the, if if autonomous vehicle does not happen in five years I think it will probably will happen in 10 years right mm. so I think we have to be uh, very hopeful because I think I mean, especially from the technology viewpoint I'm very hopeful because I think we are especially uh, for people in uh, like us in engineering school um, I think uh, technology technology wise I think we are getting there I think we are getting there um, but I think the uh, um, the the thing that are not getting there or a little bit lacking behind is is over perception per, per, per perhaps the market itself and also uh, the human aspects of uh, social human aspects of things and um, probably these are the things we need to catch up so maybe Ray you have some inputs here no I think uh, it, you know it, what's going to be behind the acceptance uh, of such vehicles is um, uh, you know as as you mentioned um, uh, increase uh, you know more tests and if they all f uh, fall in the direction of a high degree of safety that may uh, push it but mainly people are going to have to see well why do I need an, uh, an autonomous vehicle a connected one rather than just driving my own car and it's got to be ready and uh, ready to go when they want it to go <laughs> and nearby and uh you know but after all people use a lot of ubers and uh um shared vehicles and and stuff like that and maybe autonomous vehicles can be integrated into that that kind of service so you know it's going to take a while <laughs> all right thank you both very much for presenting today and thanks to the participants